Let's pray. Our beloved Heavenly Father, once again we come into your presence with awe and with wonder because you're the great God. You're the God above all gods. You're the creator. You're the redeemer. You're our sustainer. You gave us your holy word so that we could have certainty in this world of confusion. Father, as we open your word today, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. As we study the financial secrets of the sanctuary, we ask for divine guidance, soften hearts and open minds. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin our study today by turning in my Bible, and I invite you to turn in yours, to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 17 and 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 17 and 18. This is speaking about Israel entering the promised land, and God is giving them a warning. And there's some very important information in this warning that God shares with the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Then you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he wrote, which he swore to your fathers as it is in this day. This verse expresses a very important principle, and that is that God is the one who gives us the power to acquire wealth. Furthermore, other passages of Scripture make it very clear that the wealth that we amass is really not our wealth at all. Because everything belongs to God. In Psalm 24 and verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, we don't really own anything. Even the wealth we amass and we accumulate is not ours but his. Now God gave a way in which we can remember that he is the owner and we are his stewards. God has given us a test and that test has to do with the tithe. You see the tithe is the method that God uses to test us to see if we recognize that everything that we have really actually belongs to God. Now I'd like us first of all in our study today to take a look at the tithing system in the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament. That's what we're going to begin with. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 27 and we'll read verse 30 and then we'll also read verse 32. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, and then we'll jump down to verse 32. Here we find the following words. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And concerning the tithe, of the herd, this is verse 32, and concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. Very clearly, these verses tell us that the tithe is holy and that the tithe belongs to the Lord in a very special way. Now the question is, what was the tithe system established for? Okay, 10% of our income is in a special way God's, and God has given, us, given that as a test to see if we recognize him as the owner of everything that we possess. But what was the money of the tithe to be used for? Turn with me to Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20. 
You see, Israel was composed of 12 tribes, as we know. And there was one of those tribes, the tribe of Levi, that did not receive any inheritance in the land of Canaan. In other words, every tribe of Israel got a portion of land to distribute among the different families. But the tribe of Levi received no land, they received no inheritance in the land of Canaan when Israel entered the promised land. So the question is, how were the Levites to sustain themselves? Notice Numbers chapter 18, verse 20, where we are told that they received no inheritance. It says there, Then the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. So God is saying, I am the inheritance of Israel. Aaron uh, and also of the Levites because you received no plot of land in the land of Canaan. Now what were the tithes given to Aaron and to the Levites for? Notice Numbers chapter 18 verse 21, the very next verse. Here God is speaking and he says, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel. Now let's stop there for a minute. Who gave the Levites the tithe? God gave the Levites the tithe. So who paid the Levites? God did. You know, it's become very common in the church today for people to withhold tithe if they don't like the pastor. Because they say, we pay your salary. The fact is that this text tells us that the church members do not pay the salary of the pastor. God pays the salary of the pastor. This text says it very clearly. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel. Now notice the reason why. It continues saying, as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, they met the spiritual needs of Israel. And because they were employed full time in meeting the needs, spiritual needs of Israel, Israel was supposed to bring the tithes and God paid the Levites with the tithes. Now I would like you to notice also Numbers chapter 18 and verse 24. Once again, the same concept is expressed all over again. It says here, for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, notice the idea once again, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So who gave the Levites the tithe? Yes, the church members brought their tithes to the sanctuary, to the temple, but really God was paying them for the spiritual service that they rendered to the congregation of Israel. Now there's an interesting detail there in, the, in Numbers chapter 18, and that is that even the Levites tithed the tithe. Notice what we find in Leviticus chapter 18, and verse 26. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 26. It says here, Speak thus to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you, notice once again the same idea, which I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. So notice once again that not only was the congregation to tithe, but the Levites were supposed to tithe the tithe. Basically the reason why is because the Levites were the ministers of Israel and they were supposed to give a good example. How can a minister ask the congregation to tithe if the minister is not faithful in tithing? The pastor is to be an example to his flock. And so we're told that 
the ministers in the sanctuary, the Levites, had to offer a tithe of the tithe. Now the question is, what if the priesthood became corrupt? Well, the Bible tells us that there were periods when the priesthood of Israel was very corrupt. And the congregation would be tempted probably to say, why should we take our tithes for those guys to make, earn a living if they're in apostasy? Let's notice one of those examples of apostasy in Israel. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, and then we will read verse 8. Malachi chapter 1, and we'll read verse 6, and then we'll jump down to verse 8. Here God, actually the book of Malachi, God is complaining a lot about the apostasy of Israel. This is what he says. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I, if then I am the father, where is my honor, says God. And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts to yo, you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what have we despised your name? Notice verse 8. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, the Bible says that they were supposed to offer unblemished sacrifices. They were taking advantage. They said, oh, let's offer this blind one. We can't sell it for a good price, so let's offer it to the Lord. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? Ask the Lord. And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord? So they were offering lame, sick, and blind sacrifices. They despised the name of the Lord, and they did not reverence him. In fact, they didn't even teach the people the law. They weren't preaching what they were supposed to be preaching. Notice Malachi chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8. Malachi chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Here God is indicting the priesthood with the following words. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way, you have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. If you continue reading the book of Malachi, you're going to notice that the people were in a deplorable spiritual condition. And much of the guilt was with the priests who were not teaching and preaching what they should have. And they were offering, as I mentioned, lame and sick sacrifices, blind sacrifices, and so on. So you might have expected God to say, don't pay those preachers with the tithe. They don't deserve it. But the interesting thing is that in that very book of Malachi, where you have all of this description of a problematic priesthood, God had some very interesting things to say about the tithe. Notice Malachi chapter 3 and verse 7. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 7. It says here, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. And then God calls upon Israel. He says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? And now comes an interesting passage. God is going to tell them in which way they need to return. Incidentally, that word return is the same word that is translated converted in the Old Testament. In other words, God is calling for a true conversion experience from his people who have made it a custom to go astray. Now notice how God answers the question, in what way shall we return? Malachi chapter 3 and verses 8 and 9. This is very solemn. Will a man rob God... Is it possible to rob God? You better believe it. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And God answers, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. So one of the things that they weren't doing was tithing. 
the way that was required. So you have a corrupt priesthood and you have people who are not tithing and perhaps they're not tithing because the priesthood is corrupt. But now I want you to notice what God has to say. He doesn't say don't bring your tithes to uh, the sanctuary because those corrupt priests, you know, they're not doing their job. Just hang on to it. No. Even after talking about the apostasy of Israel, that they were robbing God in their tithes and offerings, notice what God had to say. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So what does God tell his people? Even his people who are not tithing and, uh, and they have a corrupt priesthood that is serving in the sanctuary, is God saying don't tithe? No, he's saying you need to bring all of your tithes and offerings to the storehouse. Incidentally, the storehouse is a place in the temple where the sacrifices and where the tithes were brought and they were stored in order to pay the Levites for their service. Notice 1 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 20 on this idea that in the house of the Lord there was a treasury. In other words, they were to bring their tithes and offerings to the temple, to the sanctuary. It says there in 1 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 20, of the Levites, Ahijah was over the treasuries of the house of God and over the treasuries of the dedicated things. The dedicated things are the holy things that Israel brought to the sanctuary. And so there was a place in the sanctuary where the tithes were stored to remunerate the Levites for the service that they rendered to the children of Israel. Now it's common for many Christians to say, well, Pastor Bohr, wasn't the tithe for the Old Testament? Wasn't the tithe for Israel? You know, it's interesting. Anything that demands a sacrifice, Christians today say that was for the Jews. For example, keeping the Sabbath, they say, oh, a whole day? I can't go shopping, I can't watch basketball, and I can't watch football? No, the Sabbath was for the Jews. And then you speak to them about healthful living, not eating pork and shrimp and lobster. They say, no, 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 that was for the Jews. They had a different digestive system than we do. <laughs> and then you have here the tithe, returning 10% to the Lord to show that, that the Lord is the owner. No, that was for the Jews. And so Christians say, all you need to do is believe. Don't worry about keeping the Sabbath. Don't worry about tithing. Don't worry about what you eat and what you drink. It doesn't make any difference. Just believe in the Lord, you and your house, and you will be saved. Now, does the New Testament reenact the idea that the tithe is to go to remunerate the ministry for their full-time work in the cause of God? Go with me to 1 Corinthians. This is a very interesting passage in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I believe that this is the most powerful passage on tithing that we find in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want to begin by reading verses 1 to 3. Basically, the gist of these verses is that the Apostle Paul is saying that the fruit of his labor are the Corinthians. They're the proof that God has called him as an apostle, that God has called him as a minister. Let's read Verses 1 to 3. Here the Apostle Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? In other words, he's worked to win the Corinthians to the gospel. If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord my defense to those who examine me in this. In other words, there are individuals who were criticizing Paul and say, you weren't called to the ministry. Paul is saying, the Corinthians, the conversion of the Corinthians, and their accepting the gospel is an evidence that I was called as, a, as an apostle and I was sent to them. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 4 through 6. 
Now Paul is going to discuss a very thorny issue. It seems like the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were traveling, and we know that Paul had to make tents in order to sustain himself. And uh, we don't know exactly what Barnabas did. Maybe he helped him build tents as well. But I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Here he says, Do we have no right to eat and drink? Talking about himself and Barnabas. Do we have no right to take along a believing wife? In other words, on our trips, can't we take our wives with us? As do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, that is uh, Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? I like the way the NIV translates it. Is it only Barnabas and I who must work for a living? <laughs> In other words, he's saying, is it Barnabas and me that cannot benefit from financial support from the church that we have to work in order to get financial support? That's what he's saying. And then the Apostle Paul argues using four different analogies that it is necessary for those who work in preaching the gospel to be remunerated for their spiritual work. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. He's going to use four analogies. He says, Whoever goes to war at his own expense, imagine the U.S. government saying, now you're going to go to war, but you have to pay for your own food, and you have to pay for your own clothes, and you have to pay for your own lodging, and you have to pay for your own weapons. Oh, that would be, nobody would join the army, right? Nobody would join the armed forces. Because when you serve in the army, what happens? Everything is provided because you're working in the army or you're working in the armed forces. And so he says, whoever goes to war at his own expense. Now, that's the first example. Second example, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? <laughs> Pretty logical, isn't it? Now he gives a third analogy. Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? You see the three analogies? Going to war, the second is planting a vineyard, and the third is tending a flock. And then he gives the fourth analogy, and he amplifies this one even more. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 8 and 9. He says, do I say these things as a mere man? Basically what he's saying, is this merely my own human opinion? Notice what he continues saying. Or does not the law say the same also? Now, there's the three examples that I've given. Is that my human opinion? Are those just analogies I invented? Or does perhaps the law also say the same thing that I'm telling you? Now, notice the text that he's going to refer to. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 4. He continues saying in verse 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Why not? Because the ox is working, treading the grain, and he has a right to what? A right to eat of the grain. Exactly. Now notice what it continues saying. Is it oxen God is concerned about? In other words, did God give this law because he was so worried about oxen being able to eat because they work? I want you to notice what he says in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 10. Because you're going to say this was written not for oxen, this was written for us, for those who work in the gospel. Because you see, an ox is a beast of burden, and he serves his master. And so the apostle Paul is saying, we are apostles that preach the gospel, and we serve our master. So this was written not for the good of oxen alone, it was written for those who preach the gospel. Notice what he says in verse 10. Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? Did he say this for oxen, or does he say it altogether for our sakes? And then he answers his own question. For our own sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. What is the Apostle Paul saying here? He's saying that an individual who preaches the gospel should be what? 
should be remunerated because of the work that he performs by preaching the gospel. Now notice 1 Corinthians 9, 11, and 12 where he continues his argument and he makes it very clear. He says, if we, that is the apostles who preach, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Are you understanding what he's saying? In other words, if we serve your spiritual needs, is it too much to ask you to supply our material or our physical needs? Verse 12. If others are our partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? And then he says, nevertheless, we have not used this right. Notice that it's not a privilege, it is a what? It is a right according to him. So he says in verse 12, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, or this, uh, yes, this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Now the next two verses are critically important. Have you understood his argument so far? Now the next two verses are, are really crucial because they deal with the sanctuary. And this is a series on the sanctuary. He's going to take what happened with the Levites and he is going to apply it to those who preach the gospel in New Testament times. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13. He says, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things, who were the ones who ministered the holy things? The priests, the Levites. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? Not talking about the tithes that were brought? Absolutely. Notice. And those who serve at the altar, who were the ones who served at the altar? The priests. And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Now listen carefully. Even so, what does even so mean? In the same way as back there, the Lord has recommended, the Lord has suggested it doesn't say the Lord has recommended or suggested. It says the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Is, is he saying that the tithe is also a New Testament principle? He's saying very clearly that the tithe is also a New Testament principle. And if you continue reading, we're not going to do it right now, you can read verses 15 through 18. The Apostle Paul basically says, you know, I have not, re I have not asked for this right to be applied to me. I build tents. And the reason why is because if I received money for preaching the gospel, my enemies would say that I'm in preaching for the money. So he said, I am a self-supporting missionary. But he says that doesn't mean that all who preach the gospel must be self-supporting missionaries. Because he very clearly says that those who share the gospel should live from the gospel. And that was done from the time. Now, it's very interesting to notice that the book of Hebrews tells us that the tithe, or the, the priesthood rather, of the Levites was abolished when Jesus died at the cross. And so some Christians say, well, if the priesthood was abolished at the cross, that must mean that the tithing that remunerated the priests was also done away with. Now let's read those texts that speak about the uh, Levitical priesthood coming to an end. Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 18 and 19. Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 18 and 19. It's comparing the New Testament system with Christ having arrived and the Old Testament system of offerings and sacrifices. Here it says, For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment, and if you read the context, it's talking about the commandments concerning the priests, not the commandments of God in Exodus 20. So it says, For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. When it says the law, once again, read the context. It's speaking about the law of the priesthood. 
On the other hand, there is what? The bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So what happened with the old system, the old commandments having to do with the priesthood? They were what? They were annulled because of their weakness and unprofitableness. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 21 makes it very clear that it was the Levites who were supposed to receive the tithe. Let's read that again because it's very important. It says, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, the argument that is used for, by many Christians is this. The Levitical priesthood was done away with when Jesus died at the cross. And because the Levitical priesthood was done away with when Jesus died at the cross, the funds that people were to bring to remunerate that priesthood also were done away at the cross. Now let me ask you, does that sound pretty logical? It sounds very logical to me. I don't know if it does to you, but if the Levitical priesthood is no longer functioning because it was done away with, then it would stand to reason that the tithes that people brought to sustain that priesthood no longer have to be brought. Now, I see some eyebrows rising and say, Pastor Bohr, are you saying that we don't have to tithe? Not at all. <laughs> I'm using the argument that many Christians use. But now I'm going to show you biblically that even though the Levitical priesthood came to an end and there were no Levite priests anymore, that the tithing principle still endures. And now listen carefully to the line of reasoning that I'm going to use. We're going to go first of all to Genesis, and then we are going to go to the book of Hebrews and examine something very interesting. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 14. And you say, what could Genesis 14 have to do with tithing? It has a lot to do with tithing. Now, the story that we find in Genesis chapter 14 is being written, or is actually taking place, 500 years before the Levitical priesthood was established. That is an important point. It's happening between 1900 and 2000 BC. And the Levitical priesthood was established around the year 1445 BC. So this is about 500 years before the Levitical priesthood, this story that we're going to take a look at is taking place. Now the story of Genesis chapter 14 is that four kings allied themselves, themselves to go fight against the king of Sodom. And of course, in Sodom, who lived? Lot lived in Sodom. And so these four kings joined forces, they went to Sodom, they conquered the city, they took captives, including Lot, and they looted the cities and took all of the possessions from the cities. Now when Abraham heard about this, he said, I have to go and I have to rescue Lot and I also have to get all of those possessions back. And so he uh, gathered 318 choice men, very carefully chosen, to go and battle against those four kings to get back Lot and the loot. Now, he was successful. He overcame these kings. He got Lot back. He acquired all of the possessions back again. And on his way back, something very interesting happened. He met on the way a mysterious figure that seems to appear and then disappear from the biblical record. The name of this individual was Melchizedek. Let's read about this in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. Very interesting that there was a priesthood before the priesthood of Levi. It was the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now notice, then Melchizedek, verse 18, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Isn't that interesting? When do we use bread and wine? We use bread and wine at communion. This is at, 
apparently a communion service, at least in figure or in type. And so it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And it says he was the what? The priest of most high God. Question, was there a priesthood before the Levitical priesthood? There was a priesthood before the Levitical priesthood. Now, let's notice how the story continues developing. Remember, this is happening 500 years before the Levitical priesthood is established. Let's go to verse 19. It says there in verse 19, speaking about Melchizedek, and he blessed him. Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high. And now notice this possessor of heaven and earth. How is the Most High spoken of? He is the what? He is the possessor of heaven and earth. It means that he is the owner of heaven and earth. Interesting that Melchizedek would introduce the Most High God who is the possessor and owner of everything. Now the question is, what did Abraham do when Melchizedek blessed him and when Melchizedek said that he represented the Most High God, he was a priest of the Most High God, and that God was the possessor of heaven and earth? What did Abraham immediately feel like he had to do? Absolutely. Notice what we find in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. It says, And blessed be God most high, still Melchizedek speaking, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And now speaking about Abraham, and he gave him a tithe of all. Did Abraham recognize that because God is the possessor of heaven and earth, he needed to return a faithful tithe to the high priest Melchizedek? Absolutely. So did the priesthood exist before the Levitical priesthood? Yes. Did tithing exist before the Levitical priesthood? Absolutely. It's not part of the Mosaic law. It predates the Mosaic law, according to Scripture. Now, what does the priesthood of Melchizedek represent? You know, it's interesting that Jesus was, was from which tribe? He was from the tribe of Judah. Did Jesus have a right to be high priest if he was from the tribe of Judah? Absolutely not. He had the right, the right to be what? King, but not priest. So Jesus could not be priest according to the order of Aaron because that was the tribe of Levi. So Jesus could not be a priest according to the order of Aaron. He had to be priest from a different order. And what order is Jesus a priest after? He's after the order of Melchizedek. You see, Melchizedek gives him the right to be a priest, and Judah gives him the right to be king. Are you with me or not? Now, let's notice Psalm 110 and verse 4, where we find this, uh, another reference to Melchizedek and his priesthood, and how long that priesthood was going to last. Did the, did the priesthood of the Levites come to an end? Yes or no? Does the priesthood of Melchizedek ever come to an end? No. Notice what we find in Psalm 110 and verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever. A priest for how long? Forever, according to the order of Aaron. No, according to the order of whom? Of Melchizedek. The question is, in whom is this psalm fulfilled, and with whom? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Hebrews chapter 6, and verses 19 and 20. Here, the Apostle Paul, whom I believe to be behind the book of Hebrews, says this, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
Notice another reference, there are many references to this same verse, Psalm 110 verse 4 in Hebrews, but let's read only one more. Hebrews 7 and verse 17. Speaking about Jesus, it says, For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So you have the priesthood of Levi, which received tithes, and that priesthood came to an end. But you have another priesthood, which is the priesthood of Melchizedek, and that priest lasts forever, priest, priesthood lasts forever. Was there tithing under both priesthoods? Yes, there was tithing under the priesthood of Aaron, which came to an end, but there was also tithing under the priesthood of who? Of Melchizedek. So is the tithe principle something that predates the Levitical system? Is it something that we need to do forever? Absolutely, because the priesthood of Christ is forever. Now, the argument of Hebrews 7 is very tricky. So allow me to just go through this. I'm going to go through it slowly so that you can understand it. If you read Hebrews 7, verses 4 through 10, this is the line of argument. We don't usually argue this way in our world today. But this is inspired scripture, and we can trust it. Basically, the idea is this. Melchizedek was greater than Abraham for two reasons. Number one, Melchizedek was greater than Abraham because Abraham blessed him, and the one who blesses is greater than the one who is blessed. That's number one. Number two, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham because Abraham gave Melchizedek the tithes. Are you understanding this? So in two ways, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Number one, because Melchizedek blessed Abraham and the one who blesses is greater. And number two is that Melchizedek received the tithes from Abraham and not the other way around. Now, listen carefully. Was Levi a descendant of Abraham? Sure, Levi was the son of whom? The son of Jacob. And Jacob was the son of whom? Of uh, the son of Isaac. And Isaac was the son of whom? The son of Abraham. Now listen carefully to the line of argument. Levi was in the loins of Abraham, because he's a descendant of Abraham, when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Now we don't usually argue that way, but, but that's the way that the argument goes. See, because Levi descends from Abraham, when Abraham gave Melchizedek the tithes, Levi was giving the tithes to Melchizedek. So whose priesthood is greater? The priesthood of Melchizedek. But the, the argument continues. Therefore, when Abraham gave the tithe to Melchizedek, Levi was giving the tithe to Melchizedek through the instrumentality of Abraham. Because the Levites gave the tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham, and Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek, the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of the Levites. Are you, were you able to follow that? A very important line of argument. And so, the tithe today is still binding. Because there is a priesthood that is greater than the priesthood of the Levites. It's still a priesthood. It's the priesthood of Christ. And there is also tithing in connection with it because Melchizedek in the Old Testament received what? He received the tithes. So is the tithe principle still binding for Christians today? Yes. It most certainly is still binding. Not necessarily according to the order of Aaron, but according to the order of whom? According to the order of Melchizedek, which is a greater priesthood than the priesthood of Levi. Now let me talk a little bit about the tithe in practical terms. Fresno Central Church receives approximately $1.2 million in tithe per year. But Fresno, but Fresno Central Church does not hang on to one penny of those $1.2 million. All of the $1.2 million goes to our central office in Clovis. And the money is used to remunerate all of the pastors in the Central California area. And some of you are probably thinking they're saying, 
You know, if we have enough tithe to pay for ten pastors, why do we only have two pastors paid by conference funds? Well, let me tell you why. And I'm not complaining about this. It's because other churches don't have enough tithe funds to pay for a pastor. And so the pastors, that the, the churches that have more income as tithe, they help the smaller churches so that the smaller churches can have pastoral help. Isn't that magnanimous? Isn't that God's plan for the strong to help the weak? And so Fresno Central Church does not retain one penny of the tithe. You say, well, how does the church function then? Let me ask you, can we rob God in offerings also? Let me read you back once again, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. Very important verse. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And then God answers, in tithes and offerings. Now you're saying if Fresno Central doesn't, to keep, doesn't get to keep any of its tithe, how does the church run financially? Well, let me say that our church has a budget, a yearly budget, of approximately $300,000. That's our yearly budget at Fresno Central Church. But we can't use the tithe for that because the tithe does not stay here. We have to pay things such as, let me give you a list, Utilities, insurance, newsletter, telephone, evangelistic materials, phone, office secretary, custodial, grounds, uh, pho photocopies, Sabbath school supplies, flowers, youth ministries, pathfinders, vacation Bible school, community services, repairs, school subsidy, tuition assistance, departmental expenses, among other things. So the question is, how can Fresno Central function financially if we don't get to keep any of the tithe? The answer is simply that there's a little line on your tithe envelope that says church budget. And that money all stays at Fresno Central Church. Every penny that you give for church budget stays at Fresno Central Church, and it's distributed among all of those uh, things that I mentioned to pay for the expenses of Fresno Central Church. So when you've returned your tithe, you haven't given a penny, because that's not yours anyway. The tithe belongs to the Lord. We don't pay tithe, we return tithe. It comes through our fingers and we return it to God. In other words, we're not being generous by returning the tithe because the tithe isn't ours in the first place. Are you following me? It's in the offerings where we show our gratitude and our thankfulness to God, particularly when we sustain the ministry of our church. Now, Fresno Central has perennially been behind in its church budget. Sometimes when we get to the month of October, November, our treasurer doesn't have any fingernails left because he's been chewing at his fingernails. The same our finance committee chair. I always tell them, we live by faith, not by fright. <laughs> and all, every year for the last 15 years, we've operated in the black. I say, don't worry about it. God's people will come through because lots of people settle their accounts at the end of the year. But we really shouldn't have to function that way. If everybody in the church contributed a certain percentage of their income, not only the 10% of tithe, but a certain percentage of their income to church budget, we would never be behind. We would be in the black all throughout the course of the year. But we have a tendency to pro procrastinate, and we have other priorities other than the priority of the house of God, of the church. Now allow me to say a few things about offerings. God wants us to be disciplined givers. He doesn't want us to do like many people do when they see uh, the, the elder get up and say, and now it's time to pick up the tithes and offerings. Would the deacons please stand? So, oh, it's offering time. And so you look for coins or you look for a dollar or two and put it in the offering plate. That is undisciplined giving. God does not want us to give in that way. He wants us to be planned givers. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verses 1 and 2. Here we have four principles that I want to share with you concerning giving. And you know, most Christians use this to try and prove that Sunday is the day we're supposed to keep. <laughs> it's not teaching that at all. It's teaching four principles of giving. Notice what it says. Here the Apostle Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints, 
as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, this isn't only the, 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 it's not only the case of the Corinthians, he also spoke to other churches, so you must do also. Now notice, on the first day of the week, that means regularly, that's the first principle, regularly. On the first day of the week, that would be the first opportunity that they would have after working on Friday and resting on the Sabbath to calculate how much money they had earned the week before. So it says, on the first day of the week, that is regularly, let each one of you, that's the second principle, individually, each one of you, lay something aside. Principle number three, privately. Don't come to church and be an emergency giver. Do it at home and then bring it to the church. And then it continues saying, storing up as he may prosper. That's proportionately the way that God has blessed you. So four principles, regularly, individually, privately at home, and proportionately, and he says that there be no collections when I come. In other words, so I don't have to stand and twist arms and beg you to give money when I come. If you do this, on a regular basis, and you do it individually, and you do it proportionately, and you do it regularly, when I come, the money will be there, and I'll receive the money to help the saints who are needy in Jerusalem. Are you understanding the principle? It's just a matter of making up our minds, folks, that we're going to sit down and we're going to say, okay, I'm going to give such and such a percentage of my income for church budget. Tithe, non-negotiable. That is not ours. You know, we just decide to return that to the Lord. But in offerings, we need to pray about it, and we need to sit down and ask the Lord, what have you done for me? Well, you've given me everything. You're a wonderful God. So let me return to you in offerings according to what you have done for me. And then pray to God and ask God to reveal to you what percentage you should put in for church budget. Are you following me? Now, notice what we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. It says here, and this is a very important principle. If you plant one corn seed, how many ears of corn are you going to get? One or perhaps two, right? One seed, small harvest. What happens if you plant hundreds of seeds? You're going to harvest hundreds of ears of corn. That's just a principle. What you sow, you what? You reap. Now notice this. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes where? In his heart. In his heart. See, it's a decision of the heart first. See, God never asks us for our money. God asks for our heart, and when he has our heart, he has our money. Are you following me? That's why Jesus said, where a man's treasure is, that is where his heart will be also. And so notice what he continues saying in verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly. Or of necessity, that means by compulsion or by obligation. For God loves a cheerful giver. Let me read you this statement from Ellen White. Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 545. She says, listen carefully. God wants no unwilling offering. No pressed sacrifice. Those who are thoroughly converted and who appreciate the work of God, two conditions, thoroughly converted and appreciate the work of God, will give cheerfully the little required of them, considering it a privilege to bestow. Don't think that offerings is an obligation, oh, I, I got to give an offering because if I don't, God's going to curse me. Listen, we don't give in order to be blessed, we give and as a result we are blessed. We don't give to earn the favor of God, but we give. And God says, oh, here's a bonus for you. Luke 6 and verse 38. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Here once again we find the same principle expressed. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. 
for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So as we give, we receive in return. That is a principle of life. Allow me to read in closing one more statement that we find in Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. It says here, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. And now notice the promise. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The only way that you know that that is true is if you try it. God says, test me now, try me now. Give it a whirl. You know, this year, our salary in Central California Conference, the pastors, was decreased 3% because of the economy. So you know the decision that I made? I said, Lord, my salary has been decreased 3%. I'm going to increase my church budget by 3%. And the Lord has blessed immensely. <laughs> More than I could ever tell you. And so, and so let's not use the excuse, oh, the economy's bad, I just don't have it. We have to buy pizza. <laughs> right? And to buy clothing and things that we don't need, toys, etc. It's just a matter of priorities. It's a matter of what is most important in our lives. It's a matter of what comes first. And those who make Jesus Christ first and last and best are the happiest people in the world. So I would pray that as we've studied this, this isn't only academic. Okay, we need to return the tithe to remunerate the preacher, and we need to also give offerings in order to sustain the church, but that this will be a priority. We'll say, church is important to us. The preaching of the gospel is important to us. This has to be the number one priority as we order our finances on this earth. Thank you.